Okay, everyone, we're going to make a start. Good morning, afternoon, uh, or evening, everyone, depending on where you are. I uh, hope you're well and healthy and hanging in there. My name is Sergio Lara Bertial, and I'm one of the minions that supports this wonderful adventure that we call iCoach Kids, a not-for-profit global movement to support you coaches worldwide. Thank you for making the time to join us today, and welcome to iCoach Kids Shares live webinar number six, Coaching Children with a Disability, with Ken Black and Fiona Murray. Before we get going, though, uh, please let me take you through some basic family rules to make sure that everyone has the best possible experience during the webinar. First, let me just admit a few more people. <laughs> um, please keep your camera and microphone off. Uh, that makes our life much easier uh, and, and goes away with any unwanted noise. Uh, please submit questions on the chat, uh, either on YouTube or here on Zoom. And we will try to get as many people, as many questions through to Ken and Fiona later on. Please be respectful when, when you're asking the questions. And by all means, we're happy to disagree, uh, but we're here to learn and share. So please do that in a, in a respectful way. And we would love to encourage you to, to post things on social media, to be, bring more people into the iCoach Kids family and, and get more people to know uh, what it is that we are trying to do. And with that out of the way, let me also explain how the session is going to run. So both Fiona and Ken will um, speak for 15 minutes each. And then I will have a brief conversation with them to then go on to the Q&A session with questions from you from, from the audience. Today's topic is coaching children with a disability, a massively important topic on its own. But actually, as you will see, a topic that we can all learn from even if we don't coach uh, in disability sport. And to speak about it, I'm thrilled to say we have two of the most influential people in the world in this area. First up, we're going to have Ken Black. Ken has worked as a practitioner in the area of inclusive physical activity and disability for over 35 years. This includes working in special education, working as a disability sports development officer, as inclusive sport officer with the Youth Sport Trust in England, three years as a sport consultant with the Australian Sport Commission, and two years running a research and development center on disability sport at Lothbrook University. He is also the co-founder of the Inclusion Club, and he is one of the fathers of possibly the most influential adaptive physical activity framework ever, one that certainly changed the way I go about coaching full stop. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ken. So please welcome, give a, a, a big virtual round of applause to the <laughs> one and only Ken Black. <laughs> Ken, I'm going to stop sharing and then you can share your screen. Ken, thank you for thank you for joining us. No problem. Um, I'll just uh, get to my screen. Presentation. Inclusion Spectrum Framework, which incorporates the STEP adaptation tool, are two real handy ways in which any coach can help to make their sessions more inclusive. Now that can be more inclusive in many ways, not just young people who have impairments, but it could be people of different ages in the same group, uh, people of different abilities in the same group. It's very rare that coaches find themselves in front of a group of young people who are all of the same ability. Usually there are uh, a range of ability within each group that you look at. So the inclusion spectrum framework, which hopefully you can see in front of you now, we're going to go through this uh, hopefully quite quickly uh, and give you a flavor of how it works. It's a, a framework designed to provide different approaches to the teaching or coaching of physical activity and sport. And there are five main components, each of these supported by the step adaptation tool. So I'm going to go through each of these components uh, individually. Uh, the, <clears throat> the way that the inclusion spectrum is utilized by a, a coach will depend on other factors. For instance, the way that the group is made up, the age range, uh, the ability range, uh, the, the, uh, um, <clears throat> the environment, whether it's an indoor or an outdoor activity, these will have influence. But generally speaking, this is an activity-based framework. So you're looking at the activity and how you can make that work for everyone in the group. 
So we're going to look open, first of all, open activities, which is, I, I subtitle everyone can play. Uh, those activities are by nature already inclusive activities. Let me explain what I mean. In open, everyone does the same activity with minimal or no adaptations to the environment or equipment that you use. So for example, you might uh, warm ups lend themselves ideally to, uh, in, to uh, an open approach because people can warm up in the way that's best for them. You could use music or rhythm based warm ups. You can see an example here where a, a, a teacher is working with some young people and using rhythm as a way of encouraging uh, different movement. It could be unstructured play, where you might give a group of young people a small piece of equipment or ask them to work individually on uh, a particular aspect. So you might say to a group, how many ways can you balance? This allows you to observe the group uh, uh, and also assess uh, ability, who might need support, who might need to be extended because they're finding it too easy. You could also um, include in, an in open activities, cooperative games. It's games where really the group are working together to achieve an end cooperatively and collaboratively and not necessarily uh, in a competitive way or trying to, uh, um, uh, in a confrontational way. So this is cooperative activity. And another open activity is collecting or gathering games. And this could be, this particular example is a swimming based example where kids might collect floating objects from the water and bring them to uh, different collection points around the pool. You can adapt these games in many ways. Collecting and gathering games gives you as the coach uh, a way to assess movement and mobility, uh, who is uh, able to uh, respond to instruction, who is able to uh, uh, move in uh, a range of different ways. So the next part we want, want to look at is modified. Modified is where you would change the activity in order to include, so everyone is still doing the same activity, generally the whole group, but you may observe that one or two individuals require some additional support or some changes to the activity uh, that are going to enable them to participate more fully. And we're going to look at the step adaptation tool in relation to modified. You can use step with all the other parts of the spectrum, but I just want to uh, ensure that uh, in this particular um, uh, aspect, the modified aspect will look specifically at step. So step is made up of four elements, space, task, equipment, and people. And these are four areas that you can manipulate in any activity in order to make that activity more inclusive and uh, enable more people to participate. So we're going to look at each one of these uh, individually, space, task, equipment, and people. Space, uh, uh, you can look at, for instance, increasing or decreasing the size of the playing area. And generally speaking, in any activity, if you create a smaller space, this encourages more interaction, whether it's movement or whether it's a ball-based activity, Smaller space creates more interaction between the participants, between the players. If you play in a bigger space, this promotes uh, an increase in mobility and encourages young people to move more. And you have to assess the group according to how much mobility they, they have. But there's different ways of uh, considering the, uh, the modification of space. For instance, in target activities, you can vary the distance to the target. So in lots of target-based games, basketball, football, golf, rugby, boccia, the disability sport, those are all involve some kind of a target. So you can play around with the space between the player, between the participant and the target. So for instance, if a shot is successful, you can move that person further from the target. If the, if the target's missed, then that person moves closer. So you're flexible in terms of uh, how the, uh, the activity uh, is carried out. And it enables people to begin to uh, work for themselves on uh, modifying the activity. Uh, you can also modify the playing space by 
for example, creating uh, ability-based zones as part of the whole game. So for example, you might find that you're playing a whole game of basketball, but you might subdivide the uh, basketball court, perhaps lot lengthways into three zones, and you may have different abilities in each of the three zones. They're all playing basketball together, but they remain within their particular ability-based zones throughout the game. Uh, it's it's uh, just a way of enabling players to match against uh, people of uh, similar ability uh, and still be part of the whole game. You could also include safe zones. And that's where players who feel vulnerable in a very uh, manic kind of, uh, move, a lot of mo mobility and movement and lots of people moving around a court or a playing space. Some people may feel vulnerable about that initially. And so you could create zones where those players can participate but they cannot be marked or tackled by another player. So they have time to field the ball and pass it on to uh, one of their teammates. Uh, we're going to look at task now. Task is how you do the activity. So it's the way that the activity is performed. And there's many ways in which tasks can be modified. Here is a racket-based activity, a young uh, a guy here um, using a fast moving sponge ball, but you might uh, have other people who are just using their hands and using a slow moving balloon or balloon ball in order to just begin to get the rhythm and the contact that they require in order to uh, keep a ball uh, uh, moving. Or it may be using a racket, but with a slower moving uh, ball, like a beach ball or something or something similar. So task modification, people can do the same activity as part of the group, but they can be doing it in different ways that make the activity accessible to them. The other uh, thing that we can do is perform the task in different ways. So a couple of examples. In throwing, for example, you could try uh, underarm or overarm or dart type throws, or you can, uh, so different ways using your non dominant dominant hand, you're trying to uh, use two hands throwing, single arm, uh, vary the challenge for the young person. Or the coach may have to break the skill down into smaller components. So for instance, under task, if we were looking at triple jump, hop, step, jump, some young people will be able to perform uh, the sequence of hop, step, and jump and put it all together uh, almost right from the start. But other young people may have to learn these components individually before they combine them into a partial or a whole sequence. Perhaps the first part and the second part or the middle part and the last part before they ever get to the complete sequence. So it's breaking the skills down into uh, bite-sized chunks that enable the young person to uh, assimilate the individual skills required in a, in a bigger uh, series of skills. So we look at equipment now under the step adaptation tool. And it, it, it's three main things I always uh, think about in terms of equipment. You can use regular equipment in a modified way. You can adapt regular equipment for specific purposes uh, uh, or for specific individuals. Uh, and you can uh, use specially adapted equipment. So let's just look at these three things quickly. Using regular equipment in a modified way, for example, you can change the size of a ball in a, in a ball-based uh, activity to make throwing and catching easier or harder. We shouldn't always modify necessarily in order to make something easier. We may want to modify something in order to challenge young people who are finding the activity uh, not very stimulating or too easy. Uh, so if we're thinking about throwing and catching, a large ball, for example, uh, facilitates catching, and a small ball is easier to throw. We often teach throwing and catching as if it's the same skill, but some young people with control and coordination impairments will find it easier to practice catching with a large ball and throwing with a small ball. So we can see the two skills as being two separate issues uh, for uh, young people initially. Uh, Adapt regular equipment for specific purposes or individuals. So here's an example. If uh, quite often you think if a ball has bells that can help people track 
the movement of a ball. Uh, whether they have uh, vision impairment or perhaps spatial awareness uh, issues, uh, a sound ball can be um, useful. But not everyone has access to sound balls. So a simple way of creating a sound ball is to put any ball inside a plastic bag, tape it up, and when you roll the ball on the, the bag uh, on the floor, um, it crackles and people can hear it. Uh, so um, that's a, a simple way to uh, adapt an, a regular piece of equipment. Or we can look at specially adapted equipments. For example, bell balls I mentioned, foam javelins, mobility equipment that some young people may require. And then the other thing we can do is make equipment from available materials that you may find around the house. And uh, you know, I'll mention briefly at the end some uh, lockdown activities that I've been putting on video. You can make balls from newspapers. You can use plastic water bottles as targets. Uh, you can use cardboard tubes to send a ball towards a target. So we can use regular stuff you might find lying around the house and turn them into adapted equipment that can help support inclusion. If we look finally at people under step, we can adapt the way that people interact. For example, we can match players of similar ability in practice or in small-sided games or in competition. And we mentioned this earlier. If uh, you have people who are of a similar ability, you will get more opportunity to participate in the activity, handle the ball, uh, practice rallies, whatever the activity is that you're doing. We can also vary the team numbers. And this is quite an important one. People tend to think five against five, seven against seven, 11 against 11. But teams don't always have to be of equal size. So you may find that instead of five against five, seven against three might work better. Three players who have higher skill levels have to work very hard against seven players who can support each other in the game. And finally, on uh, people, some individuals might require some kind of one-to-one -one support. For example, guidance and target orientation for young people who have vision impairments. So someone, for example, creating some kind of noise above a target so that a person with vision impairment can uh, uh, better estimate where the target is. Uh, or alternative or innovative, innovative, innovative methods of communication and explanation for some young people. You may have to avoid jargon until it becomes familiar with, uh, until young people become familiar with it, for example. Uh, and so uh, we can modify the way we communicate in order to make an activity more inclusive. Okay, to look at parallel, uh, and I'm trying to move on quickly. I'm, I know I'm uh, uh, going over my time here. Parallel is- uh, If anything, Ken, carry on. Part of the spectrum. Players work on the same activity or theme, but they do in groups based upon their ability. So we've mentioned this before, but instead of them all being in the same game and we create perhaps ability zones, we can actually, where there's a very wide range of ability within the, uh, within the, the whole group, we can create smaller subgroups, two or more. So for example, you might have a volleyball type game where some people play a seated version, and others play a standing version. And people move to the group that best suits their uh, abilities. Give you some examples. This is a sitting volleyball example. You might have one group that is practicing basic skills using slow moving balloons, for example, just learning to keep the balloons in the air. You might have another group where you introduce a barrier. They're getting the idea that volleyball is about two groups of people facing each other and they can begin to uh, negotiate using a slow moving ball, the fact that they have a barrier to uh, overcome. And finally, you can introduce a net and it begins to look like uh, sitting volleyball and you can begin to introduce basic rules and a basic uh, playing area that uh, mirrors the, uh, the game. Finally, oh, it's not finally, but we're going to look at separate and alternate quickly. Some people would say, well, why would you have in an inclusion framework separate and alternate? But there may be good reasons on occasion where you might want to separate young people from the rest of the group. Uh, and the examples might be um, to 
uh, where you might want young people to work individually or with peers of similar ability, you might want to give them more time to develop the skill levels that will enable them to be reintegrated into the main group. Or you may want them to spend some time practicing specific skills. For instance, if they have a competition coming up, which is perhaps as part of a disability sport program, at some point they have to practice that with their, uh, with their uh, disabled peers. But what I would say about uh, separate and alternate is it should not be most of the time. It's just when required in order to uh, enable a young person to increase their uh, skill and uh, level and competency and it, to enable them to get back into the main group. Uh, disability sport is the last part of the spectrum. And here, if I can get on to the, here we go. Uh, let me, I've jumped on uh, a little bit too quickly. Here we go. This is uh, what we would call reverse integration, where non-disabled players are included in disability sport or adapted physical activity with their disabled peers. And we feel this is very important that in every sports program, at some point, if you have some uh, uh, young disabled people who are part of the program, that they are at the center and we reverse integrate the non-disabled young people into their activities so that they are uh, in uh, the comfort zone and not always having to uh, be integrated into uh, uh, so-called mainstream activity. Examples of uh, disability sport or adaptive physical activity where we integrate um, disabled and non-disabled people together, uh, Special Olympics uh, Unified Sports, for example, which uh, uh, Fiona may mention later, wheelchair sports, games like boccia and goalball, who are, which are Paralympic sports. And there's many, many more where you can uh, apply this uh, process. So I'm going to finish now with some uh, uh, links. Um, I just wanted to mention the fact, and I think Fiona's already mentioned it, we're in lockdown mode in many parts of the world. And um, if you check out the Inclusion Club, which uh, I was fortunate to co-found with uh, Peter Downs in Australia, in 2011, we launched it. Uh, there's a couple of new videos up there, uh, which are activities, inclusive activities that you can do at home using uh, ready, readily available materials around the house. So uh, check those out. Second, um, the Youth Sport Trust, I've got colleagues and friends there who I've worked with for many years, and they have a whole bunch of uh, different resources available at, on their website. But there's one in particular I want to uh, draw to your attention, and that's uh, this uh, free home learning resources. Uh, I've got some inclusive videos on there, but there's loads of other videos to, to, um, provided by and presented by PE teachers showing uh, lots of different sports skills. And it's, it's uh, things that young people could do at home on their own. Uh, and uh, please check out that one. And finally, if you want to review uh, um, what we've talked about uh, so far, the inclusion spectrum and step, then I Coach Kids have produced two fantastic videos, um, which uh, um, uh, Sergio and his uh, colleagues have put together. Um, I was lucky to be involved with those. And uh, these are uh, the links for those videos. So thanks very much. Uh, I think I've run over my time slightly, but uh, I hope there'll still be enough time for Fiona to do her bit. Thanks. Thanks a million, Ken. That, that's, that is truly fantastic, really. Uh, I said to you many times that the um, someone introduced me to your framework in the mid 2000s, really. I think it was the first time that I that I saw it. Um, and, and it really changed the way I go about my coaching. Uh, and I don't work specifically uh, in disability sport, although sometimes in my sessions we, um, we, are, um, we include children with disabilities physically and, and, um, and intellectual, but it's just really a framework that can be used uh, regardless of, 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 of the population, really. It's just a fantastic framework to make sure that uh, everyone um, gets the most out of the activity. Um, we're going to move on to Fiona, who is going to bring uh, bring the conceptual framework into the application specifically to, um, to the Special Olympics movement. Uh, and then we will get into a, into a bit of a conversation. So over to you, Fiona. Okay, great. Can you guys see the screen okay? Yeah. Yep. Okay. 
Okay, so um, I do see from the uh, from there's a lot of Special Olympics people on the call, so great to see that. But um, I hope you'll forgive me, those of you who are very familiar with Special Olympics, because I'm going to start and just give a little bit of an overview of who we are and what we do for anybody who's not yet familiar. Um, so thank you, Sergio, for the lovely invitation to be here. Um, and hopefully there'll be something of interest here, but really looking forward to the discussion afterwards as well. Um, so just, if I can get this to skip on. Lovely. So just for those who are not so familiar with Special Olympics, um, we're in existence since the 1960s. Um, we're founded by Eunice Kennedy Shriver, who's the sister of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, um, president of the US. And it was set up originally as a day sports camp for people with intellectual disability, primarily for children with intellectual disability. And Eunice Kennedy Shriver realized really early on the power that sport had to include people in, in the community and, and the power it had to help people grow. And this is one of the reasons that she set up this camp. And very quickly it grew to become um, what we now know to be the Special Olympics. Uh, first World Games were held in 1968, so over 50 years ago, in Soldiers Field in Chicago, um, with two nations taking part, the United States, 26 of those states represented, and Canada. Um, and really since then, we've, we've grown a long, long way. Um, but our mission has stayed the same, and I know this is a big wordy um, mission, and I don't expect everybody to be reading it, but the couple of things that I really wanted to highlight in it are the fact that Special Olympics is year round. It's not just about the Special Olympics World Games, which everybody is, is familiar with. It's about training and competing on a week in, week out basis within the local community. And the main mission that Special Olympics has is to provide people with intellectual disabilities with the opportunity to participate in sports, to develop fitness, develop skills and become part of the community. And so just in terms of who we are now, so moving on from those 1,000 athletes in two countries back in 1968, we now stretch to 6.3 million athletes around the world, um, about 40% female, a little over 40% female, 60% um, male. And you'll see there from the age groups that were quite evenly spread across um, the 8 to 15 category, 16 to 21, and 22 plus. So most of our participants are youth. Um, and we have a small number of athletes participating in the two to seven year old age group, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we've also got, and, and Ken mentioned the unified sport. So we will talk about that a little bit more later, Ken. So thanks for the lovely intro on that. Um, so we've got about 1.7 million individuals with and without intellectual disability who are unified teammates. So participating in our unified sports program all around the world and over half a million coaches. And those figures are actually from our 2018 uh, census. So we're expecting that they're gonna have grown a little bit more when we get our 2019 figures in the next few weeks. So we're big um, and we are spread all around the world. So our biggest regions would be in our Asia Pacific region where we have over 2 million athletes participating and um, smaller participation numbers in some of the other regions. But, but you can see that we have a global presence and the biggest sports that we have are the standard big ones, athletics, football, basketball, swimming, the sports that we typically see really high participation numbers in across the, across the spectrum. So in terms of uh, inclusion, I, I suppose based on the, the, the seminar today, we wanted to talk about where we're at in terms of inclusion now and where we were in the past and what inclusion means to us now and in the past. So the first thing to say is very clearly, we're at very different stages of then and now in different parts of the world. So um, in, in Europe, in North America, the status of Special Olympics and the level of inclusion that we see is very different to what we see in other parts of the world. So in the past, and some countries and some parts of the world are still in that then phase, um, we were an organization for people with intellectual disabilities we provided really the only opportunity that those individuals had to participate in any form of sport and really one of the few opportunities that they had to showcase their abilities. Um, and for very many reasons, which were very good and very fair, we were a pretty exclusive organization. So it was a pretty exclusive way to include people with disabilities. So what did it look like for us in terms of the inclusion spectrum? Well, we very definitely were sitting in that disability sport area. 
Um, we hadn't quite reached the reverse inclusion that, that Ken is talking about earlier, but we, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little minute. But very much we were a sport specifically for people with intellectual disabilities. And those were the only people who participated in our sport programming. And we sort of fell into all three of these areas, I suppose, in terms of, of the, the inclusion spectrum and how we operated our sport. We did see modified activities happening um, within, uh, within sports clubs, within schools, very much uh, the separate and alternate activities happening and certainly a lot of parallel activities where we would have had athletes very much grouped by ability level. Um, probably a lot of the time what we also saw was individuals being grouped just simply in the fact that they were athletes with disabilities and categorized as very simply low ability or high ability. And things really weren't a whole lot more nuanced than that. But over the years, things have started to change. Um, and now we are moving towards being an organization that is run by and with people with intellectual disabilities rather than just for them. Um, it's one of many, many opportunities that are out there now for people with intellectual disabilities to play sport. And we think that that's a really good thing. Um, people now, people with intellectual disabilities now have the opportunity to play sport in far more inclusive environments. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, but we see that our role in Special Olympics is to provide the opportunity for athletes with intellectual disabilities to build the confidence and the skills to be empowered to play sport whenever they want, wherever they want and with whomever they want. So it doesn't necessarily need for us to, to sit just exclusively within that um, small bubble that, that we previously existed in. So to look at uh, 21st century Special Olympics and how we are using the inclusion spectrum, I suppose we, we would see it that we are now embracing the inclusion spectrum in all its glory. Um, so with, with really with the step um, tool at the center of it. Uh, so in terms of disability sport, I mean, this is the core of what we do. This will always be the core of what we do as an organization. We will always offer traditional Special Olympic sport programming for people with intellectual disabilities. And it's got a really important, really valid place in the world. Um, but what we've started to do since the 1980s is introduce unified sports, which Ken mentioned as a, as a really lovely example of reverse integration. And unified sports is when players with and without intellectual disabilities, ideally of the same age group um, and approximately same ability level, play together on the same team. So they train together, they compete together, they travel to competition together, and they are a group of peers um, who, who play sport together. And we see that as a really quick way to develop friendships and achieve social inclusion. And we're seeing more and more the impact of that as we have generations, of, particularly of students who've grown up through playing unified sports and they they live in and believe in a much more inclusive world than existed 20 years ago um, unified sports obviously operates well in a team environment but we also have unified sports programming available in what would be traditionally individual sports um, or pair sports like badminton table tennis uh, tennis but we see as well uh, unified teams competing in athletics and swimming where they compete as part of a school team, um, which I think is a really, really nice way um, of, of making sure that everybody in every sport has the opportunity to, to play and compete inclusively. Um, and as I mentioned, it happens both in community and in sport uh, or and in school programming. So it's quite pervasive around the world. Um, and that 1.7 million unified teammates around the world is growing year on year. So Certainly excited to see where that goes in the next uh, in, our, in our next census data, which we'll get in the next few weeks. Um, but what's probably a little bit newer for us, um, and I'm, I suppose I'm looking a little bit on the competition side of things and how we how the inclusion spectrum, and maybe this is not using the right way, Ken. <laughs> um, how how our competition um, structure reflects that those um, that structure of the inclusion spectrum, and what we're seeing now quite a lot more within Special Olympics is we're no longer having isolated uh, competition opportunities where we, you know, we live in our own little bubble aside from the rest of the sports community. We're running uh, events and opportunities for competition for athletes 
through mainstream competitions. So a really nice example of this was, was at the ITU World Triathlon Series, where there was a Special Olympics division. And it ran um, alongside our World Games uh, last March, but, but as part of the ITU event. And that's a really wonderful opportunity for athletes. Not only are they having the chance to, to compete on, at a high level, but they are in there in the mix with the international triathletes, the age group athletes, and part of that ITU community and that world. And that's, that's hugely valuable for us. And we're starting as well to see a lot more of our athletes participating in open competition. And I think this is absolutely fantastic. This for me is the goal where we have our athletes who have the confidence, have the skill set, and have the, um, have the welcome there for them to participate in regular events that are happening in their local community. So I've given you some examples there, which have gone off the screen, apologies for that. But for example, the, the Boston mm -hmm. Marathon, we have athletes running in that every year. Uh, national floorball leagues, soccer leagues in, the, in local communities, road races, open water swims. And our athletes are participating in these events and they're not participating in a Special Olympics division. Although in some cases, as, I, as explained earlier, that does happen. But they're competing just in, alongside everybody else. And they're there because they're welcome. And they're there because they deserve to be there. And they're there because they're part of the sports community. Um, and so our role in that, okay, we're, we're not running those events, but our role, we see it as a facilitator, a supporter, a partner, um, somebody who collaborates and supports and prepares those individuals so that they can fledge the nest and they can go and they compete in those events. And Special Olympics is always going to be there for them where they need it, where they want it. But those opportunities are now becoming much more available. And I think it's a real sign of a much more inclusive world that is developing. And it's still a work in progress for sure. And then we have our separate modified activities that are happening all the time. This is, this is what I would think are, are really the bread and butter of our Special Olympics programming. It's how our coaches coach um, whether or not they're familiar with the inclusion spectrum, and many of them are, but whether or not they are, this is the bread and butter of what they do, how they modify their sessions, how they categorize, how they move people in and out of sessions to make sure every athlete receives the coaching and the direction and the guidance that they need to be the best athlete they can possibly be. And we see this happening, as I said, through, through community Special Olympics clubs, we see it happening through federation sports clubs in local communities. We see it happening through schools programming and our, our unified champion schools, which um, introduces uh, inclusion, not just on the sports field, but off the sports field as well through education. And all of these are underpinned by STEP. STEP is one of the tools we hear coaches using the most often um, in, in their training, in their, in their development. We hear them talking about how they use STEP to modify their activities. But we don't do all of this on our own. Um, we are now part of the global sports family. And this little graphic here, I'm not going to go into too much detail in it, but, but just this is really just to show that we currently have um, nearly, nearly 750 sports partnerships with international sports federations, with organizations like iCoach Kids. And they are so crucial to supporting us to deliver our mission to provide people with disabilities with the best access to sport programming. And specifically around this iCoach Kids program and our, the age group that we're looking at, we have two key programs that look at this, this age group. So our Young Athletes program, um, it provides a, an, an inclusive fundamental movement and sports skills program for children aged two to seven. And it's, it's been running for a little over 10 years now and it's hugely, hugely popular. But as a result of this program, we realized that there were so many athletes who were not moving into traditional sports. And so my colleagues in the young athletes team are at the moment creating a developmental sports program, which will help support coaches to support those athletes to make the transition into structured sport. And this is where I coach kids is so vital to us. Um, so they're focusing on the uh, kids aged six to 12, and they're working with um, creating some age appropriate sports programming for children with intellectual disabilities, but also which can be delivered in a very inclusive environment. So through schools and communities. And um, the program will be delivered through multi-sport multi um, experiences, which 
we believe is really important in the development of, of our athletes, but also can be delivered in a, a sports specific club um, situation or school situation. And it really focuses on skill development and introduction to, to formal sport, I guess, in an age and developmentally appropriate way. So just to give you a quick overview, some of the sports that we're currently looking at, and these, I'm conscious I'm running out of time, sorry. Um, and these are the sports um, that we're currently looking at, but we are always looking for new sports partners to work with. So for any, uh, any representatives from sports federations that are interested in engaging with us on this, we're, we're really excited to start pushing this out a little bit more. And our work with iCoach Kids has been really crucial. We're, we're creating some e-learning content and some uh, implementation guides that will be available in the very near future. So in short, we've got a lot done, but we have a lot more to do. We believe the world can be a much more inclusive place and we're constantly working towards that, but we believe that we can also be a much more inclusive organization. And we are continuing to, to push forward in that direction. We're embracing a, this concept of unified leadership where we work with individuals with intellectual disabilities, not for them, not to uh, deliver a program for them, but to deliver programs with them in line with what their needs and wants are. And I suppose fundamentally, we believe that inclusion is not just a single action that a person takes or that a coach takes or that a club takes. It's about a way of life and a way of thinking. Um, and so that is really where we're active. There's a couple well, very difficult to read links here and um, that I, I'm sure you can you can uh, refer to if if that's helpful and um, you find lots of resources on our website on specialolympics.org and in addition we've got an online learning portal which has lots of um, interesting resources there for coaches uh, e-learning modules at learn.specialolympics.org so please do feel free all of that is free and available to anyone who who wishes to um, to visit and Sergio, I'll wrap up and hand back to you now. Fiona, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, um, okay, Fiona, can two really outstanding presentations really with lots of ideas and, and lots of things to, um, to get our teeth into. I'm gonna start us off with one question and then I'm going to ask you some questions that have come from the audience. But my main question from your experience, and I'm gonna go to Ken first, okay? But from your experience of working on the ground with coaches and supporting coaches to be more inclusive and deliver inclusive sessions. Um, Sergio, can you just say that I just lost you there, it faded. Uh, can you give me that again? Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start with a question. Can you hear me now, Ken? Yes. Yeah, great. So from your experience of, um, of working on the ground, supporting coaches to de develop and to deliver more inclusive sessions, um, look at your framework, uh, what elements of the framework or what, what, uh, what skills are the coaches struggling the most with? What, what's the hardest thing to do for a coach in trying to be inclusive? Okay, well, I just wanted to pick up on something that Fiona just said. Um, that was a great presentation. It was, it's the thing she finished with really is I, something I've always tried to encourage coaches to, uh, um, to adopt is an inclusion mentality so that they, they think inclusively. So when I've been fortunate to deliver programs or to teach and work with local people in many countries around the world, um, we've always aimed inclusion at the whole community and not at specific uh, um, parts of the community. Well, we'll just work with these disabled kids or we'll just work with this specific uh, impairment group. I think uh, if, if they see inclusion as something and the inclusion spectrum as something that will help them in all their work, even if they don't have young people who have overt impairments in their group, they can use the spectrum to uh, a, a, adapt their programs, their uh, sessions for the, a range of activity, a range of ability, sorry, that they will inevitably encounter uh, whether it's young people let, beginning to learn, uh, whether it's a range of ability around a, a certain skill, you change this, you change the activity from one to another, and people's skills will change. So people that were struggling with one skill will become uh, um, better uh, if you change to a different uh, activity. So the spectrum is designed to be flexible and to be used uh, to support the. Um, 
the adoption of this inclusion mentality. Thank you, Ken. And and Fiona, from from what you've seen on the ground, what What's the hardest thing to get their head around for coaches trying to be inclusive? I think, I mean, when you look from the from from where I'm sitting in the global context, it's it's so different from from country to country. And even you know, when you look at the the background that coaches come from, that really that really changes. So I don't think you could probably generalize something specific, but in in parts of the world, we get a um, a lot of our coaches will come from. Um, special education background and they're really used to accommodating different needs but oftentimes in that case it's the this it, making sure that the sport specific technical challenges there can be really difficult but then on the flip side um often I, actually that's probably the biggest one is is really making sure that there's sufficient challenge there um i think and it probably ties back into what ken said that um you know it's it's making sure that the modifications that are made are are sort of at an individual level rather than sort of the the lowest common denominator if you will and making sure that everybody is included by making sure that every it's easy for everybody which of course then misses out the the group who have a, a higher ability level on a specific task thanks Fiona. again on that note back to you uh, how much, how much of inclusion practice or inclusive practice is about planning, and how much is about making decisions on the spot, making adaptations on the spot? I think it's well, it's both. I, 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 one thing which I would say with regard to the spectrum is you can actually use it as a planning tool. You can use it as an assessment tool. There's something again that Fiona mentioned near the beginning of our presentation, which was. The, the, um, the degree to which Special Olympics was an open, uh, a modified, uh, uh, a disability sport organization. You can actually, coaches can uh, use the spectrum uh, as a sort of assessment tool to look at, at their uh, sessions and to analyze how much of the time they are doing open activities. I always suggest that we have an open warm up and an open uh, walk, cool down. And people always forget about the cool down, but we're supposed to do that at the end. But um, open warm up, and, and then it gives you a kind of symmetrical shape to your session. Everyone is together at the beginning, everyone's together at the end. But you can use the spectrum to see how much of the session is open, how much of it am I having to modify activities in order to make sure everyone is included? How much of the time have I got some individuals on their own uh, working separately? And what you want is the percentages of those things to uh, begin to even out. You don't want 90% of the time the kids that are um, developing their skills being on their own. You want them to be part of the group as much as possible. So you can use it to kind of analyze how much you're... Uh, and I think in terms of the second part of your question, it's, it's keeping a flexible mindset so that it's you can you can use the spectrum in uh, in lots of ways you can use step that really is the the key because you can use that to modify the activity in each of those four areas and you may have to just do that very quickly so you can change an activity a ball based activity for the whole group by just using a slower ball everyone else is able to still participate but you've slowed the ball down sufficiently for perhaps that one person who was having difficulty in tracking the movement to be part of the game so it's it's just being flexible uh and uh and thinking about the ways in which the spectrum can work for you i love that idea kind of, of using the uh, the spectrum as a as a self-assessment tool really to see where yeah. where your sessions are i think that's really powerful um fiona there was a lot of um a lot of questions on the chat around the idea of unified sports okay yeah and, and the idea that ken mentioned around reverse integration um that's working really well for you isn't it yeah it's huge um and i think we're, we're particularly seeing huge growth with it in schools programming because i think it you know that the whole notion of of social inclusion and integrating children with and without into intellectual disabilities as schools become more integrated um it's like playing together training together it's a wonderful way to just level the playing field and one of the one of the 
fantastic fringe benefits that we see with it is it actually and this is anecdotal i wouldn't say we have any any solid data to support it at this stage but but also we're seeing that a lot of children who might otherwise have dropped out of sport are staying engaged in sport because it's another opportunity for them to play which i think is you know another great example of of inclusion um, but yeah we are seeing just the numbers are growing year year on year and one of the really great things we're also seeing is as those children age out of secondary school, they're, they're aging out, particularly both, both the children with and without intellectual disabilities, they're aging out with a, with a much more inclusive view of the world. Those with intellectual disabilities see themselves as strong and capable and just as deserving as participate, of participation in, in sport activities and life as, as their peers without intellectual disabilities. And those without intellectual disabilities are just, um, they're, they're in culture. It's, it's inclusion is how they think. Inclusiveness is how they think. And that's terrific, really, that uh, in the end, the benefits are for, for both types of participants, really, even more so for the, uh, the, the, the children yeah. who have not moved without the disability, really. They, they get a lot from, um, from participation. That takes me to another question that was in the chat um, for you, Ken. Um, someone uh, mentioned in, in PE lessons, uh, a lot of the times when we are in the middle of the lessons, we are doing a parallel activity or separate uh, alternative activity. And then we bring people together at the end. But at that point, the more capable children tend to take over the activity. So you have been, uh, Kaylin from Ireland was asking for some advice in relation to how do we make sure that people can play together, but- Yes, yeah. No, I, I think that you've got to uh, remember that the different approaches are there as kind of, you know, tools, things that you can do. If, if, you're no, if you notice that some people are being excluded, uh, if the whole group are doing an activity, then I say you might modify the activity for certain individuals, the way that they participate, or make a modification that affects the whole group in order that somebody can be part of that. In parallel, uh, that's really just a tool. It's not saying you do that for the whole session. It's just uh, to enable people to develop skills at a, a rate and, and, and in a sort of version of the activity that's right for them. But one way of bringing ability groups together is to um, uh, use uh, a kind of, uh, uh, when I was talking about space, and the easiest way for me to show you this is just to, to uh, do it in an illustration. Okay, so we've got a playing area here like this. I don't know if everybody can see that. We've got the playing area, okay? I like your PowerPoint. What we can do is we can subdivide it like this. Okay, so we've got three areas. In each area, we can have people participating uh, in ability groups, okay? Now it's one game, say it was a kind of, uh, say it was a soccer based or say it was netball or basketball based. It is one game, okay? But the ball moves from uh, area to area and the ball moves from area to area. Everyone is in the game, but they remain within their own uh, zones. So they're all playing the one game and from time to time, you can move people around the zone so that sometimes they can be in defense, sometimes they can be in attack, sometimes they can be in midfield. So you can play around with the, uh, the way that the uh, area is uh, uh, subdivided in order to uh, put ability groups still sticking with the parallel, if you like, but it's parallel within the same game. Yeah. Uh, and I, I mentioned just another quick one. I mentioned... Uh, basketball so if we've got uh, if we've got a basketball court like this okay can you see that sort of yep. a basketball court um i haven't really done it very well but we can subdivide that longitudinally so we can make it a lengthways subdivision and we could for example have wheelchair users in the um, for example or people whose ability is at a different level in the central zone. And we could have ambulant players uh, in the outer zones. Like this. 
Okay, so you you can play around with the way that the area is uh, subdivided and still have everyone playing the same game, but in ability uh, um, uh, matched zones. That's 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 great, Ken. That really uh, really really paints a picture of how you can do it. So that, that's fantastic. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry, my pictures aren't that great. <laughs> <laughs> No, they were they were absolutely fantastic. Um, I was going to ask another question to um, to Fiona, really in relation to unified sport. So uh, there's been a couple of questions in relation to how do how do we create opportunities? Uh, but I'm not sure if the question was around unified sport or or, or sport for children with a, an intellectual disability, but around the idea of safe opportunities to compete in combat sports. So what yeah, really that's, a, that's a tricky one from a Special Olympics perspective. Um, it doesn't offer combat sports um, and they are at the moment, they are on, unfortunately, on a list of, of prohibited sports um, from the Special Olympics perspective. I know that there are um, in some countries at a national level, there are um, there are combat sports taking place. Judo, for example. Judo is actually the only combat sport that, that is approved, but um, I I don't believe there is direct contact in that in that um, in the type of, of competition that's offered. I think probably that the best advice would be for anybody who's interested in in exploring that the best advice would be to contact if it's specifically in relation with to Special Olympics would be to contact the local program in their country and they will be able to to identify whether they're in a position to work with them. Some countries do seek a special approval from Special Olympics International to offer a, a particular combat sports at a local level, and that can be facilitated. Um, but right now, at, a, at an international level, it's not something that we do. And I apologize, because that's probably not the answer that was, <laughs> was being sought, but, but hopefully at least that can direct you to, um, you know, wh where you can get a little bit more information locally. Can I say yeah. something about that? Yeah, Go ahead, Ken. Um, there are... Uh, there's, there's a, a unique organization that I've uh, been fortunate to do some work with. They're based in Oxford in England called ECAIDO. And ECAIDO are really the only uh, integrated uh, uh, martial arts program I, I've ever come across anywhere in, in the world, really. Uh, they, all, they actually have done quite a lot of work in Ireland, uh, uh, Fiona. So that's, uh, but if uh, your colleague, uh, not to waste any more time, if there's anybody in the in in that's still in the webinar who would like some individual, because uh, I've noticed a, a couple of the questions coming up, I I know of individuals who could um, you know provide you with uh, good you know um, practical information. I noticed there was a question, for example, about blind football. Well, I was fortunate to work at the University of Worcester uh, recently, where I was teaching um, uh, adapted sport with a guy. Uh, who is probably the world expert on coaching uh, blind football, uh, I'd be happy to put the person that asked that question in touch. And also the person on martial arts, I'd be happy to put that question in, in that person in touch with my colleagues at Ekaido. Thank you. So in that sense, if anybody wants to get in, in direct contact with Ken, please let me know and I can connect you. Yeah, definitely. Great. Um, Ken, there was a question for you in relation to another um, inclusion framework or, or uh, uh, another framework that is being put forward um, as a way to make activity more inclusive, the, the TREE framework? Uh, TREE, um, yeah. I actually, <laughs> I was directly involved with TREE um, in that I was lucky to work for the Australian Sports Commission and I uh, I worked with my colleague, Peter Downs. Uh, we eventually uh, created the inclusion club together. And um, uh, TREE is basically the version of STEP that is used in uh, Australia and in some other countries and actually in Ireland. Um, uh, and, and, uh, so, uh, and I think it was because Peter did some work there uh, before me and uh, so um, they established tree. It really uh, is just another way of um, uh, breaking up an activity into components that you are able to change. So tree is uh, teaching style, rules 
environment and equipment. And so you can change any of those four things. So to me, I, I, it doesn't matter if you use step or tree. Uh, in fact, as I've been going around the world, um, we've uh, tried to develop local language versions of step or tree, um, you know, you know where, where you can, uh, um, uh, I'm just trying to think what the Spanish one is. I, I think it's, uh, uh, I think we used to, for space, it was espacio, um, uh, for task, it was tarea, um, for uh, equipment, it was equipos, and uh, for um, people, it was personas. So we, we could use the Spanish word for step, which is paso, uh, and that, uh, that helped us to um, uh, have step in Spanish. So you can develop a step or tree on your own version of it. It's just a way of breaking the equipment, the uh, activity into bits that you can then manipulate in order to make it more inclusive. Thanks, Ken. And, and your Spanish pronunciation was flawless. I'm <laughs> very impressed. Excelente. <laughs> uh, Fiona, another question for you, really. Um, as you said in your presentation, the growth of the Special Olympics really over the last two decades has been incredible. Um, what do you put that down to really? What, what have you done well to, and I'm saying growth both in terms of numbers, but I, I'm also aware that dropout is very, very little in, in, um, in Special Olympics as far as I know, compared to mainstream sport. Um, yeah. What have you done well? I mean, I think in a, in a lot of cases, it was, it was offering an opportunity where none existed. Um, and I think what, one of the reasons for the huge growth in Special Olympics, in, particularly in the last 10 years, has been um, the expansion of the program in regions of the world where people with intellectual disabilities are still largely excluded. Um, and so it, it's quite unique in that context. I think we forget sometimes in, in Western Europe that you know, while, while the situation certainly is, is far from perfect, um, people with intellectual disabilities are much less excluded now than they were in the past. Um, as I said, you know, we're still at the then stage in an awful lot of parts of the world. Um, so I think that's been a huge part of it. I, I think um, the work with schools has been a huge, um, a huge part of that as well. I think what, what our schools programming does is engages children at, at a young age, um, through their physical education programming, um, both in special schools, but also in mainstream schools and in integrated schools. And, and I think that's been a big part of it. And um, we're still seeing massive growth in, in schools programming. Um, and I think the partnership work that we ha have done with a lot of sports federations has been huge. So one great example of that, we've a very strong partnership with the Babington World Federation, and, and we've seen growth of about 60,000 athletes um, in the past 12 months in, uh, in Babington across the world. So when we're able to reach into sports-specific community structures and community clubs, um, it opens up a new world um, for, for Special Olympics and for Special Olympics athletes. Um, as to the dropout, um, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're excited to... to work with I coach kids over the next over the next uh, while to, to learn a little bit more about that but uh, um, I think what we do see is we still do see quite a significant drop off at the end of, of school ages particularly in countries where the program is heavily school based and um, we do have countries where it is not heavily school based and we don't see maybe that same level of drop off um, but we don't have the huge broad base at, at youth age groups in those cases. Um, but we definitely do have, have a big drop off at that 18, 19 age group. Um, so mm -hmm. I think there's, there's a lot more work we need to do to really understand that. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly an interesting one. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Can I say something? Uh, sure. Go ahead, Ken. Um, uh, the uh, Special Olympics, uh, um, maybe 10 years ago, developed a, um, a great program through a, a colleague uh, called Glenn Roswell. Uh, which was um, uh, Special Olympics in the university curriculum. Yes, and yeah. it's a ready-made program that universities could drop into their adapted physical activity programs. And uh, I don't think it's been promoted heavily by Special Olympics in recent years, but it's a great program. It's, 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 it's ready to just drop in. 
And uh, I would recommend uh, perhaps um, people get in touch with Special Olympics uh, International uh, uh, to see if they are interested in utilizing that program within their own uh, adapted physical activity um, university or higher education programs. Yeah, it's a good point, Ken. It's a it's a it's an unbelievable resource. It was, you know, as you say, developed at really top-notch people. Um, and you're right, Ken, it probably is something that's sort of um it's sort of fallen to the side a little bit, but it, but it's there and it's available. Um possibly in need of some um some slight updates, but but certainly the you know the core messaging there is 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 really good, and it and it is it is in operation in a, in you know in a number of universities, particularly around Europe. Um, but but certainly, yeah, if anyone's interested, please do reach out, and I'll help connect you to the right individuals. Thank you, um, and I'm going to finish with a with a really big question. Okay, so we could be here for another couple of hours, but I know that a lot of the people listening will either be um, leaders in their countries or organizations that will be thinking about developing training opportunities for coaches that are going to work in you know that, that need to become more inclusive so i'm going to go to ken first but ken when you start developing a training opportunity to improve your ability to be an inclusive coach where do you like to start so i just lost part of your question there um keep just give me it again sorry yeah so when you are uh, developing training for for coaches to help them become more inclusive, because that's what a lot of people are going to be doing, uh, people that are on this call. Yeah. What, what's your starting point? What do you prioritize at the beginning? Well, I, I, initially I try to um, work with them uh, to to help them realize that they have all the skills they need now to be able to be an inclusive coach. They they're. They, you know, they they don't realize how much sometimes, you know, over the years when I've worked with people, I say I've been lucky to work in many parts of the world. I just wanted to give a shout out to Danny in Hong Kong. I haven't seen him for a long time, but I noticed he's in the uh, he's in the webinar. Um, uh, I've been very fortunate to work with people around the world, but I they quite often they don't realize they're already modifying things. They're already uh, modifying the way they communicate because they change the way they communicate if they're working with younger kids or teenagers or adults. If they 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 change the way the the um, the intensity uh, in terms of uh, you know physical activity or sports that they're uh, coaching, dependent on the uh, level of the kids. So beginners are going to make it less intense, more fun. They're going to get um, a little bit more. Uh, structured as they uh, get uh, get with the older kids who've got uh, better competencies. So they're already modifying things. So uh, one of the points that I tried to do early on is to try and get them to realize that it's not a big jump to go from what they're already doing towards uh, uh, being more inclusive. They're just widening the parameters. They, they're already um, quite often uh, modifying and they just need to broaden that to take in people at either end of the uh, spectrum. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. That, that's that's really valuable, really, because I think sometimes we feel like uh, someone has to be special to be able to do this. <laughs> Most people, everybody, as you say, has the tools to do it already. Fiona, how does that work for you in the Special Olympics? Where, where, where do you yeah. guys normally start? Yeah, I mean, I think very much the same. I mean, our, our, our attitude very much is that, you know, go coaching is go coaching. And exactly to your point, Ken, you know, coaches do this all day, every day. They're already, they're already applying all of those skills. What we try and reinforce is it, our, our simple things like to, to, you know, use concrete language and concrete concepts to keep their instructions brief but that's just making those modifications that they already make but scaling them down a little bit i, I think one of the other messages that we we really try to to push across is that not to be afraid um to challenge their athletes you know it giving people an opportunity to succeed doesn't mean every effort needs to result in a success you know fa the failures are part of how we learn um, and I think we try to make sure that our coaches are confident enough that um, it's OK for their athletes to experience that failure on the on the journey, on their learning journey in sport. Um, 
not obviously repeatedly and incessantly, but but in a way that helps learning. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's it's not a mystery. Um, it's it's just a question of being being brave enough to give it a go and being confident enough to make mistakes and learn from them. Thank you, Fiona. Well, well listen, on, on that note, I'm going to start wrapping up. Um, thank you so much for a fantastic webinar. Um, the feedback coming through in the chat is, is really good. People seem to have taken a lot from it. And everybody wants to get in touch with you, so we will make sure that that can happen. Um, while before we finish, um, please, just to, to encourage everyone, to have a look at the YouTube channel of iCoach Kids, where there's over 120 videos with very, very good content that hopefully will, will really support you in your development and help you support others as well. There is three e-learning courses that you can, you can sign up to. You can go on the website and, and look at the blogs. And by all means, follow us on social media where we have a lot of activity going on. And finally, before we go, also to encourage you to come to our next webinar. Uh, there's nothing on next week, but the week after, uh, we're going to be speaking to Professor Jean McKenna from Leeds Beckett cool. University about behavior change tips for coaches. If you've never listened to Jim speak, you can't miss it. Uh, you will be absolutely amazed by, by Jim. So I hope to see everybody there. Once again, thanks a million to Fiona and Ken. And stay safe, um, stay healthy, and we'll see you next time. Thanks again. Thank you so much.